let's continue talking about reproduction, specifically the female side of that process, and more specifically about two different cycles, one of which is the uterine cycle, the other is the ovarian cycle. The uterine cycle involves changes within the endometrium, specifically the stratum functionalis, which involves menses and the rebuilding up that stratum functionalis subsequent to menses, or in the event that pregnancy does not occur. The other cycle is the ovarian cycle, which culminates with the release of the egg from the ovary, which is known as ovulation. And there's two other cycles or two other phases, phases I should say, related to that. And that is the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So we'll look at that. A lot of this is dictated by hormones released from the ovaries, estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is also released from the adrenal cortex as is progesterone and estrogen can also be released from fat cells. In addition to that, we have FSH, follicle stimulating hormone and LH, luteinizing hormone, which is released from the pituitary gland of the brain. The pituitary gland is a pea-sized gland inferior to the hypothalamus that resides directly in the hypophyseal fossa of the sphenoid bone. So we're gonna take a look at all of this. Here we see an ovary, and once again, most females have two ovaries that are physically connected to the uterus via the round ligaments, broad ligaments, and also held in place by the suspensory ligaments. I don't think I talked about the suspensory ligaments when we looked at this in detail. The capsule of the ovary is known as the tunica albuginea. And like any solid organ in the body, there's a cortex to the ovary and a medulla. The medulla is the interior of it. The cortex is the periphery of it. Within this ovary, we see a bunch of developing eggs. Now, to be clear, the process of oogenesis, which is female meiosis, involves a number of different stages of development of those eggs that start in utero when that individual, when that female is in the uterus of her mother, and it moves along from oogonia, which are germ cells or stem cells for developing eggs, to primary oocytes and secondary oocytes. I'm not concerned about those different stages of oogenesis, that is to say, whether we're dealing with a primary oocyte or secondary oocyte. As a result, I am just going to refer to these cells as eggs or ova, egg or ovum. I'm not differentiating or delineating on whether or not they're primary oocytes or secondary oocytes. So within the ovaries, we have one thing happening. We have a number of things happening, one of which is oogenesis. Now the developing eggs will develop within a structure known as the follicle, and that's what we see in pink right here. And the developing follicle goes through stages itself, primary follicle, secondary follicle, follicle, what have you. And this is known as folliculogenesis, the development of the follicles. And I've dramatically simplified it in this image. image. And one thing I have not illustrated correctly is folliculogenesis, the development of the follicles, is really retained within the cortex of the ovary. It shouldn't be in the medulla as I've drawn here. This big structure right here is the final stage in development, and that's what's known as a graphene follicle. Oogenesis begins in utero for females, stalls right about birth, and then resumes once a month when that female reaches sexual maturity. Now, it's about 20 to 25 ova that actually resume development or resume meiosis at sexual maturity once a month. It is only going to be one of those that actually completes meiosis and actually gets ovulated. And to be clear, meiosis officially doesn't become complete unless fertilization occurs. But what we're dealing here is just to the point of ovulation. So 20 to 25 
OVA, resume development, resume meiosis once a month. Only one of them is going to complete that process, ending up with ovulation. So it, right here, we have the developing egg in a developing follicle. This is a graphene follicle. This right here is an antrum, which is an estrogen-rich secretion within the graphene follicle. And then we have ovulation, which happens and results in the release of that egg into the pelvic cavity. And then the fimbri of the fallopian tube are going to sweep that egg into the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. Same thing. And either it's going to get fertilized within the fallopian tube and implant on the endometrium resulting in pregnancy, or it's not. After ovulation, the graphene follicle will turn into a structure known as the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is going to start secreting a hormone known as progesterone, which is aimed at supporting pregnancy. So the theory is that that ovulated egg is going to be fertilized and pregnancy is going to occur. And the goal of the corpus luteum is to enhance that development of the zygote and embryo and continued development of the uterus. Now, I just threw in the term uterus there because the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle are intimately tied to each other, though separate at the same time. And I say separate because we're dealing with two totally different structures, the uterus and the ovary. If pregnancy does not occur at a point in time, the corpus luteum is going to degenerate into a scarred up tissue known as the corpus albicans, not shown in this image. So in this image, we have the follicle, graphene follicle, ovulation, corpus luteum, and then that would develop into the corpus albicans. Now, this is all determined by hormones. So I'm going to tell you right now, ovulation is the result in the huge spike of a hormone known as luteinizing hormone or just LH. LH, once again, is released from the anterior pituitary gland as is FSH. So there is certainly a, a spike in L FSH as well, but it's a dramatic spike in LH. And certainly there's also a spike in estrogen that causes ovulation. But once again, it's the dramatic spike in luteinizing hormone that causes ovulation or the release of the egg from the ovary. So as the follicle starts developing, the follicle starts releasing more and more estrogen. So during folliculogenesis, during a phase known as the follicular phase, estrogen increases gradually. Then we get a huge spike in luteinizing hormone and that causes ovulation. Once ovulation occurs, we're going to start to get a pretty good dramatic increase in progesterone from the corpus luteum. There is certainly going to be an increase of estrogen as well, but it's a much more dramatic increase in progesterone due to the release of progesterone from the corpus luteum. This is what's known as the luteal phase. So we have a follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. The follicular phase is going to last roughly 1 to 14 days. So one thing I need to back up and say, the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle take about 28 days. This is highly variable. It could be 21 days or as long as 40 days, but generally we refer to it as a 28-day cycle. The first 14 days of the ovarian cycle is the follicular phase. Day 14 is ovulation, and then day 15 to day 18 is the luteal phase. I say day 14 is ovulation. Like most things in the body, this is variable. It could be day 12 to day 14. It could be day 11 to day 15, but generally we refer to it as the midpoint of the ovarian cycle, which would be day 14. And here's that cycle right here. In blue, we have the follicular phase, which is once again, days one through 13. Day 14 is ovulation. And I have this broad orange here for ovulation due to the variability in timing of ovulation. And after that, we have the luteal phase. 
Follicular phase, once again, sees the gradual increase of estrogen being released from the follicles. Ovulation is due to the huge spike in luteinizing hormone. And during the luteal phase, we do have a resumption in the increase of estrogen, but a dramatic increase of progesterone in anticipation of pregnancy. The very end of the luteal phase, if pregnancy does not occur, is going to result in a dramatic drop-off of all the hormones as the corpus luteum turns into the corpus albicans. So we get a dramatic decrease in progesterone and estrogen, which will resume the follicular phase for the next 28 days. Like I said, we are dealing with two cycles here. We just talked about the ovarian cycle, which deals with these ovaries right here. And that will culminate in ovulation. The uterus as well goes through cyclic changes every 28 days. And once again, this is highly variable for the uterus as well. Just a quick review. This is the potential space of the uterus where the embryo, fetus, and baby would develop. It is lined by endometrium, which is composed of simple columnar epithelial tissue which is represented by the stratum functionalis. Underneath the stratum functionalis, there is a basal layer known as the stratum basale or stratum basalis, which are germ cells that will replace the stratum functionalis when the stratum functionalis is shed off or after the stratum functionalis is shed off. The shedding of the stratum functionalis is what's known as menses. It happens when fertilization or pregnancy does not result immediately after ovulation. So right here, we have the endometrium. Once again, the endometrium is composed of the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. Underneath that, we see the myometrium. And what we see here are spiral arteries, which are spiraling up or radiating out to the apical surface of the endometrium. And it is during the very end of the luteal phase where the corpus luteum turns into the corpus albicans, and I'm talking, and now I'm relating the ovarian cycle to the uterine cycle because the uterine cycle is influenced by the release of hormones from the, ovar from the ovaries. So when the corpus luteum degenerates into the corpus albicans, we get a dramatic increase in progesterone and estrogen. And this is going to result in spasmatic contractions of these spiral arteries. And it's going to cut off blood supply to the stratum functionalis and result in necrotic tissue or the death of that tissue. And that is going to cause the shedding off of the stratum functionalis. So it's going to be the dramatic fall in progesterone and estrogen, which is going to precipitate menses. It's going to cause the death of the stratum functionalis. The stratum functionalis will shed off the shedding off of the stratum functionalis is menses. And that happens for roughly five days. So when we're talking about the uterine cycle, day one to day five is menses. Once again, this is highly variable. Okay, so this is the uterine cycle. Once again, day one to five is menses. Day six to 14 is the proliferative phase. And the proliferative phase is due to mitotic activity resulting in an, from an increase of estrogen. That increase of estrogen is coming from the graphene follicles or the developing follicles within the ovarian cycle. And the proliferative phase results in the rebuilding of the stratum functionalis due to mitotic activity. Once the stratum functionalis has been rebuilt at roughly day 15, it starts getting augmented with glycogen-rich secretions. And this is known as the secretory phase. And the secretory phase is the result of a continual, gradual increase of estrogen, as well as a dramatic increase in progesterone, which is being secreted by the corpus luteum. The whole goal of the secretory phase is to prepare this, prepare the endometrium for the implantation of the zygote and the developing embryo. If that does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates. There is a 
dramatic drop in progesterone and estrogen. And that's going to lead to maybe a fourth little phase known as the premenstrual phase which results in the spasmodic contractions of those spiral arteries that we talked about, the tissue death, and that will lead to menses. Menses day one to five, proliferative phase day six to 14, and the secretory phase day 15 to day 28. So we've just talked about two different cycles, the ovarian cycle, which happens within the ovaries, folliculogenesis and oogenesis, the development of the growing follicle and the development of the egg. The uterine cycle involves the rebuilding of a very robust, nutritious endometrium for the hopes or anticipation of the implantation of a zygote or embryo. Once again, these are two distinct cycles, two distinct organs, but intimately related to each other. So we can overlay those two cycles like this. Menses proliferative phase correspond for the most part to all of the follicular phase that is happening within the ovaries. The luteal phase is most of the secretory phase. Luteal phase is the release of progesterone from the corpus luteum, which is going to help develop a glycogen-rich endometrium. Glycogen, once again, is the storage form of glucose for that developing zygote or embryo. Ovulation, once again, is the result of that huge spike in luteinizing hormone. Ovulation is going to occur 14 days after the beginning, the first day of menses. So theoretically, one can count from the first day of menses, 14 days, and suppose that's when ovulation is going to occur. That may work, but it may not work due to the fluctuation in the days. And that is it for our two female reproductive cycles, the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle.